This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. The discussion about racism and injustice has hit historic levels in the past few months. And today we offer a perspective from a husband and wife. Not only are they pastors, but they're also uniquely qualified to share their viewpoint being in a biracial relationship since high school. Bill and Lynn Thimolaris met and fell in love near Wheeling, West Virginia. And I begin our discussion today of how Lynn learned about racism abruptly at the age of 13. When did you find out that, there was, that, that this whole thing involved hate rather than just fear or a difference? We're, we're different, so I'm not sure about you, but mm -hmm. where, did you, where did you first feel that yeah. there, was, there was hate yeah. in that whole thing? I think the first time it really hit me that mm -hmm. it was hate was I was a, a softball player. I was a competitive um, softball player, loved the sport. And anyone who plays most community sports, mm -hmm. at the end of every game, you know, you walk, each team comes onto oh, yeah. the field or the court, sportsmanship, and you're <laughs> high-fiving, yeah, good game, good sure. game, even though it was a bad game, good mm -hmm. game, good game. And I remember walking through, good game, good game, and I got to this one particular young woman, young lady, young girl, and she put her hand down and said the word. Out loud. Out loud to my face as I am passing Enough her by. Enough for other people to hear it? Loud enough. I, I don't think she people in the- She comfortable doing that. Though. Comfortable mm -hmm. enough in doing it. Um, I don't think people <clears throat> in the stands necessarily heard yeah. it, but my team heard it, her team heard it, her coaches had to have heard it, and no one said anything, not even on my team, not even my coach, no one said anything to the young girl who said it. They just hoped it would go away. Just hoped it would go away. Stayed away and- And uh, you just, I was left there wondering like, does, did, am I the only one who thinks this was inappropriate? And so nobody did, said anything to you to and comfort then no you, one like said, your teammates yeah, or your, your no one, coach? No yeah. one said yeah. anything. Did that change your attitude about white people? You know what? Praise God that I had the Lord in my life <laughs> because it really didn't. My best friend at the time was white mm -hmm. and I knew her, I knew her family. And I think because I was fortunate enough to have other people in my life that acted different, who treated me well mm -hmm. and loved on me, it really did help keep me grounded and not get angry. Yeah. Mm. And then at, at what age were you then at that, at that time? I was 10 years old. So this is before you met the big guy here. This was, oh. yes, yeah, not okay. too much longer. We met about three years later. But yeah, we did. So you, you, yeah. Met, you met in junior high, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Did, how were your, your ideas of racism different when you first met? Did you, did you have any concept of this is a, this is a racially charged situation or this is, yeah. the, how, how did you feel That's in, high, a great in junior question. high school? Well, I grew up in, the, in, in Wheeling, West Virginia in the Ohio Valley and, and mm -hmm. kind of bounced around the, the valley growing up. And again, that area um, was just you know, 98, 99% white. And so mm -hmm. uh, I understood racism in the sense that uh, many members of my family uh, were racist or would make off color comments mm -hmm. or uh, watching a sporting event or something. And I remember it thinking- just naturally come out of their mouth. Yeah, just, yeah, it was just like common speech. Mm -hmm. And so I just remember something in mm -hmm. my heart that it just didn't feel right. I thought, man, this, that's, I, that's not a good feeling. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't share those thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so then, of course, I did meet Lynn. Uh, surprisingly, I was, we met at a church event and she was the only black person in the room. She was probably the only black person that had ever stepped foot in that church, what, what, to what, my knowledge. What gave you the courage to go do that? Well, the it's church, a church that, event. I yeah, mean, well, the church group. that I was a part of, we had a traveling youth ministry that would sing and dance and do drama. We would just do these little events. Yeah. And I, at that point, I had kind of gotten used to learning how to navigate mm -hmm. where I could be, all, as Paul said, all things, to all people, <laughs> you know. Um, but so when I walked in, it wasn't something that I wasn't, I had been in many other churches with the same outcome. Yeah. I kind of had it in my thought process, where we go, I'm going to be the only. But you felt like you had to act differently you, you than you would have in your own home? You definitely felt like, I definitely felt like I had to make sure I had it all together mm -hmm. all the time. It's this weird feeling of, 
um, everything that I do represents the whole race of people. Mm. If I mess up, I mess up for everyone. If I do well, I do well for everyone. I've got to make yeah. sure that I represent. Yeah, she walked into that room. Uh, she, she actually was the first person I ever heard give their testimony. Uh, I didn't even know what that was. So I just thought, this girl like knows God. And I remember thinking, uh, and I, I said this too in my mind at that moment, I said, I wanna marry somebody like that. And I went home and I told my mom, I wanna marry somebody like that. And I think it was a shocker to to anybody, I didn't think anything was wrong with it, mm -hmm. but. I mean, that, that, that light didn't come on your head that she's black and I'm white, that doesn't work. That's, that's wrong yeah, for my I family. I knew I was challenging the status mm -hmm. quo, but okay. something in me was totally okay with that. Yeah. But for these next several years, we would see each other periodically on these mm -hmm. mission trips. So that's where you're seeing one another. You yeah, were seeing yeah. each other in school. No, not and we were not at first. No, we. I ended up transferring and going to the school that she went okay. to. So you're, you're you're seniors in high school at this point when you begin to date. Yep. Did you have any reservations about that? I mean, did he ask you out? Well, we were or did in the you same. Just say, Let's go get a coke together. Or well, we were originally just in the same friend group. I actually yeah. became best friends with his younger sister. Yep. I remember, I get this notes in my locker. <laughs> You remember that? Oh, yeah. I didn't know this was coming up today. I get this you, so you, slide the, yeah. you slide it to the little vent. Oh, you know, yeah, the little vent in the locker, you know. And I, oh. I get the note, and it said, and I was so confused because, honestly, I had just kind of kept a guard up, mm -hmm. unintentionally, not realizing that I had a that guard this up. Was, this was taboo. I really can't, yeah, I so really can't I, get know, any closer than I this. was way, much more aware of racial issues because I'm when sure you grow you up, Black in America, you have to really think about mm -hmm. things. And so it just didn't cross my mind that he would feel anything more so than friendship with me. So I get this note and it said um, that he appreciated who I was and all these nice things and I would really um, like to uh, get to know, get to you, know you better. <laughs> really, yeah. I was so afraid. You yeah. wanted to get close so or something. Yeah, right. and I'm, th I'm reading I'm thinking, like, how much more does he want to get to know me? I mean, <laughs> I'm at his house, like, every other weekend, hanging out with his sister, you know. He knows the kind of, like, what is he? He so, wants to get alone with you. So I'm clueless. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was funny because his sister, um, I'm like, your brother gives me this note. And she's like, yeah, he's had a thing for you for a while. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Where did this come from? You know, so it was. Was there, was there any, any electricity that went off in, in, your, in your spirit at that time? Like, he wants to get to know me better. He's well, got a thing for me. Being honest with myself, I had had a thing for him. Okay. But Woo! just when, the truth comes the out. The truth yeah, comes out. Go. I did marry him. I didn't. Yeah. That's not. <laughs> he's kind of attractive. I mean, yeah, it's kind of cute. <laughs> kind of cute. Um, but you just, you just kind of keep okay. your heart distant. You know, you got to mm -hmm. protect your guard, heart, but, guard but, your heart. But when you did, know that you were in love. Yeah. Did that mm -hmm. feel natural or did that feel kind of awkward? Like, this is kind of, this is kind of awkward that I, I'm really, I'm in love with this person. This isn't just a... Yeah, uh, it felt totally natural. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it, the, the problem was that it was unnatural and, and um, people, I think, in our world that loved us, people, friends, family, who were... So supportive loved us oh yeah you and know, they yeah. thought maybe it would just be a phase, a phase. it would wear yeah. off yeah, so like we didn't have to deal with first girlfriend boyfriend and yeah, later on and you it, go to college yeah, exactly. and exactly you meet it, the real love it wasn't going to go anywhere it's so. junior senior year yeah. going off to college you know this will fade no big deal so it's, it's a dating relationship it's not a it's right. not an in right. love yeah it's, and then there were people who i mean they're just racially biased yeah. and they are they carry these unintentional um motivations where they they, they support us, they but then the it best started, you. yeah. It's, yeah. You know, and they would, they would come and give us advice and say, you know, we want what's best for you, and, mm -hmm. and probably getting married is not going to be what's best. And mm -hmm. even well-intended people within our church, friends, uh, parents of our friends. Yeah, it was more parents of our friends, would I think, sit us than down our and say, friends. We support you and Lynn. I mean, one in particular said, we support you and Lynn. We think you're a great couple, and even if you get married, our concern is that we don't think it's good for you to have children because you don't want to bring, uh, mm -hmm. raise biracial children in, in this world. It's just not right. You know, 
black, it maybe maybe uh, mm -hmm. black people shouldn't yeah. be with white people. It's fine for us to just get along, but but yeah. getting now, married that was, that was 20, crosses the line. That was 24, 25, 26 years ago. Yeah. yeah. You think people are still giving that same advice today? I think so. Yeah. I think behind closed doors, those <laughs> private conversations still happen. Go on. Yeah, I do. How do you respond, even now or even back then, but when you were, you were the, the knight in shining armor that was going to take, sweep this lady away, how did you respond when you saw racism directed at, at Lynn? Yeah, I mean, of course, <laughs> anger is uh, something yeah. that you deal with as a, you want to protect your mm -hmm. wife, you want to protect um, your girlfriend, you, you want to protect your fiance. I mean, I remember one time we, we had just gotten engaged, I believe it was right in that period, and we were walking down the street uh, holding hands, mm -hmm. and uh, a few guys in a pickup truck just went driving by and kind of slowed down and, and yelled to me at this time the N word, N lover, uh -huh. and then, um, then picked up speed and kept going. And so this is them persecuting me based upon mm -hmm. her. And so this righteous indignation, I'm, I'm upset at them, I'm, I'm upset at the world system on why this is a problem, and then feeling like, well, she has to suffer for the fact that somebody's upset with me yeah. because of her. And that's just something that uh, never gets old. So do you direct, do you direct the anger at, at the, the demon of racism, or do you direct the anger at the, the opposite race? I mean, how do you keep from becoming a racist? Ooh, that's mm -hmm. a good question. You know. And it, I think it is tough. I think as I matured as a Christian, mm -hmm. I would recognize the spiritual aspect. Mm -hmm. And then the older that we got, the more experienced mm -hmm. we became mm -hmm. just as a interracial couple, mm -hmm. we recognized um, that there is so much, people are, are unwitting instruments. They just, just don't yeah. recognize mm -hmm. Um, how they were taught, terms that they use, mm -hmm. statements that they make that are, are, have major racial undertones of racism, bias, um, that they think is just okay because so, so many people are just mm -hmm. ignorant. Yeah. And yeah. I was ignorant. I learned how mm -hmm. to be married into a black family and thought, oh my gosh, I'm just ignorant on certain mm -hmm. things yeah. and cultures. And the more we can educate ourselves, um, is so important so that we can get along yeah. in a multicultural, yeah. racial, ethnic setting. Yeah. But what, what, what bothers you, you the most, or what, what gets to you most, overt racism or the, the things that maybe an ignorant person says who doesn't even know they're mm -hmm. being racist? What, what really bothers you more? I think what bothers me the most... Um, and what do you say to them if you say yeah. anything? Uh, I, wow. <laughs> This is a tough question. I think what bothers me more than anything is when Christians, okay, do things or say things that are racially motivated. And they're ignorant of it or and they just think it's funny or a joke? Both. Or just, both. just the fact that I guess I don't expect the world to show love and compassion. I expect the, the church to, do, to yes. do that. And... I have a hard time when I meet believers who, whether they recognize it or not, when they are confronted with it, mm -hmm. justify their actions mm -hmm. or make little of their actions. Well, I, I didn't grow up that way. Uh, well, yeah. now you're rearing up children. Mm -hmm. Now you're running a ministry. Now you're mentoring other or discipling. And if if I come to you with the concern and you slough it off, slough it off don't take make a little of it, don't, don't just, own it. A, oh, I didn't mean it that way, but don't choose to change. Don't yeah. choose to um, make it right. That's what bothers yeah. me. Yeah, I think as a church, the body of Christ needs to move from being non-racist, mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm not racist. I don't have a racial bone in my body. I hear that often. All the time. I'm not racist. I think as the church, we need to move from being non-racist to anti-racist. Anti-racist. Meaning that we have to take action steps to say, mm -hmm. you know what, we're not going to, to be complicit with just, uh, just stuff going on. We're actually going to stand up and have a voice and say, that's wrong. We can do better. We can do better. 
And, and I think for so long, the church has just been okay with saying we're non-racist. You know, we love people of all color. We love uh, people of all ethnicities. We, we would welcome anyone into our church setting to worship together, anyone into our home to have dinner. And it's kind of like a lullaby or some you're magical not, statement, but, but there's not a lot of living life that way. Mm -hmm. And so when we live life intentionally saying, I'm going to be anti anything that is, is racial, racially motivated, um, of other cultures, particularly right now in our society, the black mm -hmm. community feeling less than. It's just as simple as that. If we could just start right there, black people feel less than in so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. And as the church, as Christians, mm -hmm. we've got to recognize and say, I'm going to do something about it. I'm just, it's not going to be okay for that to happen. In a moment, we're going to learn more about the church that Bill and Lynn pastor, and we're going to find out how the church can be a catalyst for change, shining a light on racism and bringing healing to everyone. That's coming up in just a minute. But next week, I'll be talking to one of the nation's leading researchers. George Barna has been surveying the culture of our country and our worldview on religion. I'm going to ask him if there's any signs of our nation's apathy towards God changing in the future. That's on next week's Viewpoint. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Looking at a church that may not look like your corner church in your town, but is the Oasis City Church in Westerville, Ohio. With me are the, are the pastors Bill and Lynn Thimelaris. It looks a lot like your family. Yeah. It does look. Maybe like it our looks family. even more than your family because it it's not a black and white church. It's a multicultural. How would you explain it? Yeah, we we say we're a family of many races, cultures, and ages, and mm -hmm. uh, that really describes who we are. We have a lot of ethnicities. We have people from other nations, nationalities yeah. uh, represented. Mm -hmm. But yes, we are a church of black and white people mm -hmm. worshiping together, a lot of interracial families. Um, mm -hmm. And so it does look like our family, but it didn't always look like and our no, family. No, it did not always did, look like our family. Did you come to Columbus with that, with that in mind? Did God send you with that mission? And how yes. difficult was it yeah. to plant that seed? Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, when we came to Westerville and we traveled around, um, it wasn't until we got to Westerville and we were in the community center and we walked in and there was all these different races of people. You could hear different languages being spoken. Mm -hmm. And I remember just starting to cry like, this is the place because we feel called to bring people together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've heard for years that 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning is the most segregated yeah. time of the week. And we just knew that we wanted to have a church that was countercultural to that. Well, let me ask you about that. It is, I mean, it's been said that for years, it's the most segregated time in America mm -hmm. is, is Sunday morning. Is that a cultural preference or is that just the way we've grown up and we've, we've kept everybody else out? Yeah, I think because it's, some yeah. people feel more comfortable mm -hmm. worshiping Absolutely. with people of their own race. Mm -hmm. I think it's we both. know the songs. I think it's both. And um, as America became more multicultural, multiracial, yeah. um, the church kind of uh, maybe lagged behind in that. I think it's easy, and we're not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just easy to build a church, or easier, I easier say. to build a church around. Uh, commonality, mm -hmm. whether it's age, whether it is racial uh, mm -hmm. or culture. Or socioeconomic levels. Yeah, it's just, yeah. it's easier to do that. People gather with what they know. Mm -hmm. And so to be counter-cultural, mm -hmm. you have to be 
intentional yeah. Sunday looks it. like the rest of their week yeah exactly and, and, exactly. and it should look I mean our personal <laughs> conviction is that the church should look like your community mm -hmm. I mean if your community yeah. is filled with uh, whatever the, the demographics mm -hmm. are um, your ch the church the body of Christ should represent that in some way yeah. so the difference between a mixed race church mm -hmm. mixed cultural church I mean you can have Mixed cultural churches and everybody could be black. Or everybody could be exactly. white. Exactly. What's more difficult to build, and, and how do you how do you de define that and build it? Mm. Um, I think it's more it's difficult just because <clears throat> when you build a church with different races mm -hmm. together, you can't be afraid to have the difficult conversations. You can't there be you afraid go. to talk yeah. about issues that. I'm facing, but you're not facing mm -hmm. issues that you're facing that I'm not facing, and it all be important. Um, when everyone looks the same, from the same social network, the same economic network, they have different sure. things that they're worried about or concerned about. But when you bring different groups of people that that are from different walks of life mm -hmm. and cultures and races together, all of a sudden there's things to talk about that wow, I didn't even know that was an issue, or mm -hmm. I didn't know that was an issue. And w why would the enemy want us to do that? I mean, you've you got, you got a church that begins to look like the kingdom of God. Right. Yeah. And of course the enemy doesn't want that. He's going to do everything he can to destroy it. And you have to be willing to not have any... Uh, Golden calves in your in, in, in the in the church <laughs> Did in the you room. Have a few I mean, of those to destroy. Oh or man! Well, you, you have to be able to be you have to be willing to sing different songs. You have to be willing to to sound different, to look different, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to preach different. You have to be willing to say, "Hey, here's who we are. We're not we're not change. You, we're not asking anybody to change themselves. We want you to be fully who you are. But but it's but your experience in our church is mm -hmm. not." is probably not going to be just where you came from. But, but does that change you as a person? I mean, do you, do you say, I'm going to change on Sunday morning. Am I catering to this group of mm -hmm. people? Do I become that person during the week, or am I just that person on Sunday morning? Yeah. And am I, mm. am I yeah. patronizing them? Yeah. Right. I think that, um, I, I love this example, and I think you said it in a message one time that, you know, America has used the term the melting pot, mm -hmm. right? We're not trying to be the melting pot. We're trying to be the fruit bowl. Okay. In a fruit salad, yeah. there's they all different types there, yeah. of fruits. And it tastes good. <laughs> and it tastes so good. All the yeah. different flavors coming mm -hmm. together to make that fruit salad is just delicious. Mm -hmm. You know, We're not asking you to blend it all together that you can't tell one fruit from the other. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I love about having a multiracial church is when my kids go to school, they go to a multiracial school. Mm -hmm. And... I think the church should be the place that are training up our youth, training up everyone to be able to go into their sphere of influence and be the light sure. of Jesus. And if we're not teaching them how to communicate with the world and their mm -hmm. peers, the world's going to try to do it Absolutely. and they're not going to have the same message. So the church, um, I feel like at least our church is called to um, disciple people to change the world that they live in. Mm -hmm. And part of doing that is being able to talk to people who mm -hmm. don't look don't like look them, like. don't come from the same economic levels that they do, but be able to be who they are, they're part of the fruit bowl, mm -hmm. and go in there and say, this is who I am and Jesus loves you. Right. Yeah. Now you're in a large community. I mean, you're the uh, suburb of, of Columbus. Of Columbus. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you get people to, uh, Rather than just share Sunday morning together, I'm going to sit in a pew with this person and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really being good because I'm mm -hmm. going to share a pew. How do you get them to share life together? I mean, mm -hmm. to go outside the church mm -hmm. and go into the world and share life together. Yeah, that's a big value that we have. Okay. It's kind of like the first step, just coming in and, and worshiping mm -hmm. next to yeah. somebody who looks different than you. Right. And so we celebrate that. And people can say, hey, you know, I'm doing a great thing. But it must mm -hmm. go beyond that because... Uh, the scripture tells us that in Revelation, it says, you know, every nation, tribe, people, and language around the throne, you know, worshiping. So we have this idea that of this multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilingual even um, expression of worship, and God loves it. He adores it. So we want to, we want to represent that as, as we extend mm -hmm. the kingdom on the earth. So we come together and worship, but we still have to do life together mm -hmm. and sure. we and we encourage our people hey have conversations mm -hmm. with somebody 
that look different yeah. than you, that mm -hmm. are different than you. Sit down, have, mm -hmm. uh, do coffee, do dinner, get families mm -hmm. together, get around the fire pit mm -hmm. together. Really enjoy each other's presence more than just standing next to somebody uh, mm -hmm. in a worship service with your hands lifted. Mm -hmm. um, this is going well beyond that and really being the family of mm -hmm. God. How do, you, how do you really appreciate the differences of other cultures, other races, or to appreciate that difference and really say, you know, I, I want to appreciate that and grab hold of it without, and it's a different race, culture, ethnicity, mm -hmm. whatever, without feeling like, because uh, we get accused of this in the cancel culture today, right. without appropriating their culture, without, uh, without usurping their culture, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden I want to be black. Mm -hmm. And right. how, do you, how do you do that and, and maintain your, your, mm -hmm. your race? but at the same time appreciate everything that's in that, in that other person. Mm. I, I think that comes with, um, once again, intentionality, but mm -hmm. we really encourage a lot of, even our small groups and the, the things that we do together that we'll have multiple leaders in the same class so that you have one person um, ministering who may be white and one may be Asian, one may be black and one may be Asian, where everything that we're doing, you're seeing it from different sides and different um, uh, viewpoints mm -hmm. as well. So we really try to infuse that into everything that we do so that it's not a Sunday morning thing, it's a week long mm -hmm. thing, everything. Mm -hmm. um, we don't encourage, um, and sometimes it happens, you know, you have to realize that even in small groups, there's different pockets in yep. different, you know, and um, you're going to see some groups are more homogeneous because of the location, mm -hmm. but we're not going to let those be the only groups that we have. Right. You know. Yeah. One, one last question. Yeah. Sure. About church. Do you think this is that the, the church really is the, the the one great hope to eradicate racism and, and bring social justice? I firmly believe yes. it. <laughs> I firmly <laughs> believe that in a divided society, only the church can model unity. Mm -hmm. And, I, and mm -hmm. I think that you need, here's the, the thing about the scripture. Uh, unity requires diversity. It requires it. <laughs> Otherwise, we just have uniformity yeah. Yeah. and we all look alike all right. and we all wear the same uniform and we all you know, have mm -hmm. our hair the same texture and, and the same skin color. Well, to have true, mm -hmm. um, true unity. unity we have to have diverse Diversity. people coming together with to a say, common cause. We're expressing, we're, we're unified in this. And, and only Jesus can do that. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that the, the local church is, is that hope mm -hmm. to start changing, whether it's your city, mm -hmm. your community, um, or the state that you're in. I mean, I believe mm -hmm. uh, in media and social media, the church has to represent it. It is time for the church to minister to the hurting and take a more active role in addressing racism. Thanks to Bill and Lynn Thimelaris for joining us today. You can find out more about the Columbus, Ohio-based church at oasiscitychurch.com. And if you want to find out more about Viewpoint, you can find our podcast and additional interviews at wtlw.com. I'd also encourage you to support this ministry with a financial gift so we can keep producing great programs like this one. Thank you for joining us today. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.